Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. While watching the 2020 NEAEP symposium sessions, I was especially interested in a handful of webinars with Dr. Lauren Schnabel, which focused on soft tissue injury rehabilitation. Dr. Schnabel is an associate professor of equine orthopedic surgery and an assistant director of the Comparative Medicine Institute at North Carolina State University and has performed extensive research on tendon and ligament repair. As many of you know from past podcast episodes, my own gelding tore his deep digital flexor tendon in both front feet, which resulted in significant lameness and sparked my hoof obsession. Dr. Schnabel's NEAP sessions were really helpful in bringing all the rehab experiences I had together in my mind. So I reached out to her to ask her some questions and talk to her a bit about the rehabilitation she does in North Carolina. So I guess we'll start. And my first question is something I was wondering because uh, I have, you know, a horse with with soft tissue issues, which sparked my interest in in rehab. But was there something specific that sparked your interest in soft tissue rehabilitation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, most of my um, research and especially my PhD work has really been on tendon and novel therapies and regenerative therapies for tendon injuries. So for a long time, I've been thinking about ways to better heal tendon with tissue that's more normal, less scar-like, and less prone to re-injury. And when you get into all the physiology of tendon biology and how tendon heals, it's the biomechanical stimuli are really critical to healing. And that's been known for a long time, but still something that I think we overlooked for a while in the equine industry. So when we think about the intensive physical therapy that a person would get after a tendon injury, we weren't kind of on the same page as that for the horses. You know what I mean? Like we would keep them in the stalls for a long time and and limited mobility, whereas a person might go into physical therapy and be moving fairly quickly after an injury in a controlled way. So I was really fascinated by that. So even, this is kind of dorky, but even cells that you culture in the lab from tendon, you have to put them actually under stress and strain and biomechanical stimuli to get them to grow as Tina said. So they need that stimulus, which really made me think a lot about how we need to be rehabbing our horses with controlled motion to get tendon to heal properly. And and ligament is is similar, but tendon is is really critical. Yeah, that's really interesting and something I want to ask more about in a little bit. Yeah. So when it comes to, obviously my podcast focuses on the hoof. So when it comes to the most common soft tissue injuries that you see in the hoof capsule, what might those be? Yeah. So the deep digital flexor tendon injuries are probably the number one most common injury, uh, soft tissue injury within the hoof capsule. So as you know, the deep digital flexor tendon, it comes all the way down, you know, past the cannon bone, down past the fetlock canal. And then it actually inserts on the coffin bone or P3 and it glides over the back of the fetlock and then over the back of that navicular bone as well. So it has a unique structure in the way that it does that. Uh, And the tendon actually has a fair bit of fibrocartilage or special tissue on the outside so that it can glide over those surfaces. But because of the way it's positioned there, it is under a lot of strain. That's where hoof angles can come in too, which I know we're going to talk about, but that can affect the strain on that tendon. But that is the most common injury that we see. And there's numerous types of lesions described or injuries described within that deep digital flexor tendon. So there's core lesions, like we think about sort of at the um, higher up level, there are are what we call dorsal abrasions, but on the um, the front surface of the tendon, they can form adhesions as well. They can have splits. So there's numerous ways that that tendon can be injured. They can also injure that tendon right at the insertion on the coffin bone, and that's a really challenging injury when they do that. So when they sort of pull the tendon off of that piece of bone, that's super challenging to treat, unfortunately, because of that pull on the bone there um, and, and that instability at the insertion site. Other soft tissue injuries that we see within the hoof capsule are the collateral ligaments of the coffin bone. Uh, so you have a 
one on the inside or the medial side and one on the outside or lateral side. Um, and those can um, get tears or injuries in them as well. They have part of their structure within the hoof capsule and part outside. And then there's other very small ligaments that attach the navicular bone, which are less commonly injured. But I would say the deep and the collaterals are the, probably the main things that we see. And do you see a lot of like impar ligament issues or the collateral ligaments of the navicular bone? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I was kind of including those in those small ligaments. So the sesamoid bone is attached. So you have the collateral ligament, or um, some people call it the suspensory ligament of the navicular bone, but that's sort of confu- confusing for what we typically think of as a suspensory ligament, right? And then the impar ligament below. So those can, we do see changes to those on MRI is really the only way to evaluate those small ligaments. And we do see changes, but it's usually part of a more complex navicular syndrome. And those are sort of some of the more subtle things, whereas the the deep lesion can be very prominent on their own. Yeah. And you had just mentioned MRI and my, my gelding, I did um, have an MRI done, but a lot of clients that I see an MRI is just not feasible because of the cost. And we yep. don't, we don't have, I guess, I think actually a, a clinic near me did just get a standing MRI, but the one we've had, you've had to put the horse under general anesthesia, which yes. um, is increasing the cost of the, the procedure to do. But in one of your uh, sessions for the NEAP, you talked about using ultrasound or possibly using ultrasound to um, diagnose some of the issues in the hoof capsule. And can you talk a little bit more about how you might go about that? Sure. Yeah. So it is, it is challenging to ultrasound um, anything within the hoof capsule, but there are new techniques that are described. So for example, you can image at least, you know, I talked about the collateral ligament that there's a part that's outside the hoof capsule and then a part that's inside. By imaging as much as you can, sort of above the hoof capsule and at the coronary band, you can at least get an idea if those look normal or not. You can also use the ultrasound at the back of the pastern to get a view of the deep digital flexor tendon and the navicular bursa and see if there's a lot of fluid in the navicular bursa. And there's a beautiful publication on that about how to do injections of the navicular bursa that way as well. Because we used to go right on midline or the center of the leg through the deep on purpose to get into the navicular bursa for injections, like for horses with navicular syndrome. But every time you do that, you're putting a needle track through the deep. So this new ultrasound approach also allows you to spare the, you know, putting the needle through the deep, which is great. And then the other thing you can do with ultrasound, you have to really clean up the foot well, the sole and the frog, and then soak the foot overnight um, in water and just soften it up. And then you can ultrasound through the bottom of the foot. You can that way see the insertion of the deep on the coffin bone. But all of these are are nothing compared to, um, they're sort of little glimpses. We probably use them kind of more for rechecks when we've seen something on the MRI we ultrasound it right after, and then we're trying to follow it up. And then we don't want to re-anesthetize the horse for a repeat MRI unless we really absolutely have to. Because it's still, it's a, it's a vague sort of look. It's nothing as, as definitive as an MRI. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And I was wondering about yeah. that too, because that hadn't been offered to me, but I don't think they thought it could have, you know, found what they were looking for. So... Yeah, I know. I think it would be really hard to make, you know, we want to give everybody an accurate diagnosis so that we know prognosis and the best rehab plan. So I, I don't think the ultrasound could ever replace the MRI that way for sure. But it is really useful sometimes for trying to follow these cases up afterwards or for performing treatment. With my own clients, much of my rehab approach is focusing on proper movement and biomechanics to try to prevent injuries before they occur. I asked Lauren about what she looked for in movement and angles in her own rehab cases. You know, talking about rehab in general, obviously, you know, you you talked a lot about that in your sessions and ways to properly rehab a hoof and, you know, prevent issues from happening in the first place. And you talked a lot about biomechanics and hoof pastern axis or angles overall. And can you talk a little bit about what kind of biomechanic movement or angle issues might cause injury? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the most common problem, or I know the most common problem that we see 
is horses that have that uh, long toe, low heel conformation, right? So they're what we call their breakover or sort of the distance between the tip of the coffin bone to where their foot hits the ground and sort of rolls over that way as a breakover. When that distance, that breakover gets really long and their heels are really low underneath them, that puts a huge amount of strain, especially on the deep digital flexor tendon. So as we, we talked about a little bit, the deep runs down back over the surface of the navicular bone and then is attaching to P3 on the bottom of P3. So you, by bringing the toe way out or allowing the toe to be way out in front of the horse, you're putting added strain on that. So we really, it's very simple things, but basically by keeping the breakover distance where we want it, so at about 10 millimeters or 15 millimeters max, and then also making sure that the hoof is in a positive, people call it different things, but basically a positive sole plane angle is what we usually call it. So that the way that P3 is sitting within that hoof capsule, you have a positive angle from the bone down to the, the sole or the ground. Does that make sense? So the side should, it's hard without a drawing. But yeah, so that's like, a, like yeah, the like tip a, of the Palmer angle. Is that what you're yeah, 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 exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that the tip of P3 would be, yeah, you know, obviously, but the, so that the tip of P3 would be closer to the ground than the back of P3, right? So that's a positive angle versus being flat or at a negative sole plane or Palmer angle. So that negative angle, as you can imagine, would put a huge amount of strain on the deep. And unfortunately, we do see a lot of horses that are either flat or slightly negative, and we want to work on getting them back to that positive angle because of that, the way that that releases that pressure on the deep. Yeah. And you had mentioned, so talking about biomechanics with all this too, are you looking at the way the hoof is landing in terms of movement or worried about that at all during rehab? Yeah, no, that's another great question. So that especially comes into play with those collateral ligaments that are on each side. So, you know, horses are, every horse is built a little bit differently. Certainly we see horses that, you know, are towed in or towed out based on their conformation. And they may, or horses that are not balanced well, farriery wise, or, you know, some of it's just the horse and then some can be the trimming, right? But if they're off in that inside to outside balance and they're landing consistently on one side of the hoof. So let's say, the horse is consistently landing on the inside and then rolling over to the outside, inside to outside, inside to outside. They may be very prone to injuring that inside collateral ligament. So that's one example where we wanted to help them land more flat and take the stress off of that. So that definitely comes into play. As far as biomechanics, we also, a lot of the time, will roll or rock the toe so that it's not such a stiff kind of, you know, land, come off the toe, they're basically, you know, able to do that in an easier way. So especially horses with navicular syndrome, we want to be able to give them the best way to get off the ground easily or, or roll that toe. Yeah. And do you look for, I mean, during, well, with my clients, when I'm, I'll take like slow motion video from ground level and kind of assess their, their landings that way to have a baseline when I first meet them. And then if there's pathology, I'll check it often to see how they're landing. And I always look for heel first landings as a sign of comfort. Like if they're willing to fully extend that carpus and, and, you know, get those tendons fully engaged. Yeah. Um, Is that something that you think plays a role in these injuries as well? I think it does for sure. I, I, I think I use that the same way it sounds like you do just assess their comfort level. So if you'll watch them and they don't want, you know, to, to bear weight on the heel or they're just kind of getting on their toe and rolling off quick, I definitely use that as a, as a comfort assessment for sure. So I, I do think that is important. And it is, I love those slow motion videos too, because it's really interesting to watch what the horses do. It's also super interesting. This is deviating a little bit, but there are so many horses that, I don't know if you've heard about this before, but when we're doing veterinary exams and blocking, that when you block out the foot, you can actually make a upper limb lameness a lot worse. So the horse will actually be worse after you block the foot. And that's because you've taken away their ability to control how they're landing on that foot to help stop the pain. Does that make sense? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. But I didn't even realize that 
Because usually you think if you're blocking, you know, you're trying to numb the pain so that they'll go sound eventually, right? You're figuring out where the pain is coming from. But yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So a lot of people are, or the vet students are always surprised when they're like, oh my gosh, the horse is so much worse after we block the foot. Why is that? And it's, well, you've totally taken away their compensatory mechanism. So they don't feel their foot and they're not controlling how they're protecting their other injury. So I always find we see that a lot for proximal for suspensory disease and some other things, but it's really fascinating because it just shows that they can actually really purposefully place their foot in certain positions to protect things that are hurting them. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. So then it's really, I mean, obviously I think I, I involve my local vets a lot. I mean, anytime I have a lameness case, I involve the vets for diagnostics and, and collaboration in general. Um, yeah. But yeah. that. It, it makes me think about like, you know, am I trying to force a horse to land a certain way when they're trying to compensate for something higher up, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so that, no, that's a great question too. And um, I think, and I've asked myself that question too. And I think where I've gotten into trouble before is if you have a horse with a moderate to severe conformational abnormality, and the horse has been like that its whole lot, you know, like, let's say like we have, I have a, a horse now that we treat who's 12 right? He's had a severe conformational limb abnormality his whole life. He's super deviated laterally. Like we can't try to make that horse flat now. We will cripple him. You know, he's never gone like that his whole life. We can't now, like the strain that that would place on his tissues now, I think would be really damaging. So I think in cases like that, you know, once they've gotten to that point or they've been like that for a long time, I don't think we can totally change their biomechanics. But what we can do for that horse is help him so he always lands on one side is just help him roll off that so it's not like stabbing into the ground and then kind of sharply coming off that you know what I mean yeah so we just help him keep his gait but use his gait most efficiently without any extra strain yeah I think that's a really really good point that if you take a horse like that and try to make that horse straight you're going to have you're going to have problems. Yeah. So I, I, no, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And I think I'm always trying to find that sweet spot of, I want to make sure I'm helping this horse not get worse, but also not make them worse, you know? <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, exactly. And I, I think also like we use, you know, it's so, it's so great. And like you said about working with your veterinarian a lot. I mean, there's a lot of times that we'll radiograph multiple times during a trimming or shoeing to make sure like that horse that I just mentioned, he'll, get a lot of strain on his pastern joints because the way he's built on the on the one side so we trim and like make sure that the joint surface looks you know equal on the inside to the outside and that is really helpful too to guide his trimming because he's just so so sensitive most people will probably worry about movement during rehab causing re-injury and one quote i heard from rockley farm is it's not movement that's the problem it's improper movement So letting a horse bomb around outside while loading poorly on injured limbs is going to cause continual re-injury, but good, proper, controlled movement allows a physical therapy type approach to healing. Lauren and I talked a bit about this too. Yeah, and and so I know that we kind of (laughs) went on a a sidetrack, but I think that was really helpful and um, thank you for kind of exploring that a little bit. But, you know, kind of back to the soft tissue rehab in general. Yep. And this is something that I want to learn more about because even with my own horse, I think I, I kind of went about it a different way than what you, you were talking about in some of your sessions. So can you talk a little bit about weight bearing and how that, and you kind of mentioned it in the beginning of our conversation, um, yeah. how weight bearing plays a role in soft tissue repair uh, and how to properly utilize exercise during rehab? Yeah, absolutely. And it is, of course, it's going to depend a little bit on the injury but generally speaking, we want to have very controlled exercise. So like I mentioned at the start, they, they do actually need that mechanical stimulus. So you want them to actually have some, you know, force on the ground, some motion up through the tendon to stimulate healing. But again, that has to be controlled. So most of the time, we're talking about stall rest with this controlled exercise. And for most of our clients here, I try to do that under tack because the horses are just so much better behaved. So all the problems we usually have are when we're trying to hand walk horses that get wild or get away from the owner and run around. 
has happened to us all, I think, in our lives mm-hmm. at some point. But it's just that I find to be the most dangerous. So we either hand walk like within a closed space, um, but most of the time we try to, and it's great for the horse's brains to they could stay, you know, get tacked up, do think they're doing some degree of work, even if it's for short periods of time. So we always start with, you know, and again, it depends on the injury. There might be, uh, for a really severe injury, there might be a period of time where they're, they really just need to rest. And sometimes, you know, if they've had a severe tendon laceration, let's say that's, that's not within the hoof, but higher than that, they're in a cast. And obviously they're not doing anything during that time frame. But for most of our injuries, they're going to start walking immediately um, for increasing very short amounts of time, usually for about the first eight weeks of their injury. And then we try to get them up to very baby trot sets. So that might be just alongside of an arena. We definitely avoid, especially for the deep within the foot, we try to avoid any tight turns, anything like that. It's just adding in really gradually straight um, trot sets. And then if so it this is the really complicating thing with the foot, which we've talked about a little earlier, is it's so hard to monitor, right? So compared to, let's say they have a tendon lesion in the superficial core lesion, that is so easy to ultrasound. You can watch to see if the fiber pattern comes in. If there's change to the vasculature, we can really use that to guide our rehab. In the foot, we're mostly going blind because these horses aren't having repeat MRIs. And we can only do so much with the ultrasound, like I mentioned. It is useful, but it's still not nearly the same as what we can do in other locations. So we're really going by how the horse looks on lameness exam and being pretty cautious about what we're doing. Within the navicular bursa region and the tendon sheath, horses are also really prone to getting adhesions when they have tendon injuries. So that's like when tendon tissue kind of sticks to other tissue and adheres down. So that it, the adhesions are another reason why we want to keep the horses doing something generally early on because they're then less, at, if you keep them moving, they're less at risk of forming those adhesions. And we also sometimes put them through range of motion. So that can be passive range of motion, meaning you're physically flexing the leg to try to give them, you know, to keep that range of motion um, and prevent excessive adhesions or scar tissue. And we do that for the tendon sheath at the fetlock as well. And then active range of motion would be like you walk the horse over a ground pole or cavaletti, right? Just to make them flex up a little bit more. So those are all things that we add into depending upon the injury. But we do very, very slow graduated increases in exercise. We hope to be adding in these baby trot sets by about eight weeks. And we actually prefer them to be, you know, go through their full trot work, which takes about another eight weeks or longer, depending on the injury and the horse, to build them up enough that then if everything was okay on a recheck, we would start adding some canter work. Um, And we prefer them to canter or lope under saddle before they ever get any turnout um, when possible, right? Because we can't control what they do in turnout. We know that. So we want them to be as fit under saddle back to work before they have any chance to do something crazy and turn out. So that, that's our ideal. And, and how long do you usually see it taking for these tendons or ligaments to heal? Yeah, so we, I always warn owners that it's like six months to a year before they're back to work, um, you know, back to full work, I should say. And that's going to depend on the severity. All of them really take at least six months. So um. it's a long haul. Right. And I know that you already mentioned some of those exercises for, um, you know, during rehab. Uh, Did you have any other kind of specific stretches or exercises owners could do while they're rehabbing their horse? Yeah, absolutely. So all of our rehab horses, and this has been a huge benefit to to everybody, we give very specific uh, stretches and core exercises too. So this is a way to keep them mobile through their neck and back and to keep up their top line, right? So that's typically what we think of. You can tell which horses are out of work, right? Because they lose their top line, their back looks bad, they've lost the muscles on their rump, et cetera. So there are really nice exercises that the owner or trainer can do that keeps them involved with the horse during rehab and it keeps the horse in better shape to go back to work and not lose their top line. 
So I have no stock in this book at all. I just um, find it to be a really good book, which is How to Activate Your Horse's Core. And that's by Narelle Stubbs and Hillary Clayton. But it's a beautiful, like just a little spiral bound laminated book, easy to take to the barn. And it shows in detail these stretches and the core exercises. So those are, those can be belly lifts. Um, we're kind of pressing at the girth and asking the horse to use its, its core muscles. The lumbosacral tucks are kind of when you, it's hard to explain over the phone, but you run your hands just sort of over their rump and like they'll arch, you know, they'll lift up or tuck to use their core muscles. And then all the stretches just keep them really supple and pliable, which is great as well. So that is a part of rehab for every one of our horses that has really helped. And there, there's proven literature on that too, that these mobilization exercises actually do increase the, the muscle mass, especially of the top line muscles. So I, I would recommend that to anybody for sure. Yeah, I think I, I want to get that. That sounds like it's, I, I mean, I've heard of Hillary Clayton and read a bunch of her stuff. So I've been really interested in and seeing some more. Yeah, and they really don't take very long to do. I mean, one of my own horses was out of work too, had a horrible vaccine reaction, which we won't, we won't digress to that topic, but I was out of work for a long time, unfortunately, and just did that to keep him in shape and, it, you know, kept him busy. And it was, it was fun, to, you know, at least to do and he enjoyed them. But it's just, some, you know, it doesn't take much time, but it actually I mean, visibly, it makes a big difference. You can tell which, you know, which horses have had their exercises done and which haven't. I mean, you can tell. Yeah. And this is a total side note. So I I should know this, but do you have a like rehab facility? Yeah, we have here, we're working on building our rehab program. Um, So that's a great question also. So we have both myself and Dr. Caitlin Horn are boarded in sports medicine and rehab. And I run the residency program for that. As part of that, we have our rehab unit, which has, we have an aqua treadmill and a a cold and hot saltwater spa, which we love. And then lots of other, you know, modalities. Uh, Those are our main, you know, big pieces of equipment, but then lots of other modalities and ground poles, et cetera. So we have a little bit of a space issue, (laughs) meaning with stalls and the, you know, sort of competing with the main hospital. But we have plans uh, to, to build a new hospital and then our existing hospital will actually stay as the rehab facility And that way we'll have more space and our rehab horses will also be separate from any, um, not that they're together with sick horses now, but you know what I mean. It'll be a separate building, which would be nice. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And you're in North Carolina? Yes. Right in Raleigh. So it's actually for vet school, it's really nice because it's actually very centrally located uh, to the city. And we have a lot of surrounding horses um, in the area. So it's it's a great location. And the vet school is like right off the interstate. So it's, it's quite easy to get to, too. Right. And then do you have horses that will truck in from other areas or are they all pretty local? Yes. No, we have a lot that come from um, Virginia, South Carolina, kind of, uh, we have some that come from longer than that, but I would say at least those, you know, our, our state and then Virginia and South Carolina, we have routinely get a lot of horses from. Awesome. So I guess my last question is, you know, obviously we go to horses so often that have issues. So we're working on rehabbing them, but a lot of owners listen to this and I know that they'll be wanting to know how they can prevent injury in the first place or what they can look for to, you know, make sure that their horses aren't headed down a path where they might end up injured. So is there um, anything owners can watch for to prevent these injuries from occurring? Yeah. So since we're talking about the hoof, I would, you know, I'd, as, as you know, um, my feeling on that, I mean, having great foot care is absolutely essential. So there's always that phrase, no hoof, no horse, which I do firmly believe in. So we want to be really taking care of their feet the best that we can. And that, you know, the frequency and everything is going to depend on the horse and the climate, et cetera. But we want routine trimming and or shoeing, but keeping the feet properly balanced is, is super critical. And then I think, you know, we're all guilty of this sometimes, myself included, but we don't want our horses to just be weekend warriors, right? So, you know, the the more consistently they can be in work um, and and be in good shape. So the exercises are another thing that will help prevent injury, right? So um, just like you think about us, so I have a bad back, right? But if I do my Pilates and I keep up my core strength, my back is good. And that, you know, just that principle that if we can do our stretches, make them supple, we can get them core strength and they're all they're, you're going to use themselves better and be less prone to injury and then the more consistent work just to how fit they are and their work schedule is super important just so that it's not you know we're not taking them 
cold out of a pasture and asking them to do a, a great amount of work. So we know what that does to ourselves when we do that. We don't want to do that to them either. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I think this is a really great conversation. Hopefully I didn't take too much of your time. But... Oh, no, no, no. That was perfect. Yeah, okay. thank you. No, All that right. was easy. Great. Um, okay, sounds good. We'll be in touch. All right. Take care. We'll talk too. to you soon. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.